Welcome back. You're listening to the panel discussion, New Frontiers in Military Intelligence, Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning, and the Cloud, sponsored by Microsoft on federalnewsradio.com at 1500 AM. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guests today are Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan, the Director for Defense Intelligence Warfighter Support in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Margie Palmieri, the Director of Digital Warfare Office in the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations, Andrew Mansfield, the Technical Director for the Navy's Space and Naval Warfare System Center Atlantic, and Lee Madden, the General Manager of Defense for Microsoft. We've started to go down the path before break around this idea of the tactical edge, and, and it was Margie brought it up, General Shanahan, you brought it up. So let me turn to Lee a little bit. It's not just take it to the edge and be happy. There's a lot more that goes into it than just, okay, let's, let's push it out the door even further. So talk a little bit about what it takes to, to reach the tactical edge from both a cloud perspective, but also an, uh, an application perspective. Certainly, so we look at the, the full spectrum of compute from the intelligent cloud to the intelligent edge. And uh, the intelligent edge in, in, and the tactical edge kind of blend together, but there's, you have to be able to move from large scale, hyperscale cloud computing in a, in a commercial data center or in a, in a private cloud back in garrison and be able to connect out to the, the tactical edge or the intelligent edge. Uh, we've developed modular systems that allow uh, for kind of a midpoint or something you can push out to the tactical edge on a, on a platform, whether it's a ship, submarine, or aircraft, uh, or, a or even a vehicle. But we look uh, really at the importance of the intelligent edge that's allowing the user to have access to artificial intelligence in that tactical system, or in that sensor. And that's what really is going to make the difference in warfare. And I think that's where a lot of the, the projects are starting to focus today. Uh, we want to be able to uh, really drive that, that artificial intelligence to the user so it can be used in a disconnected state, in a tactical state where we don't have the bandwidth to get back to a hyperscale cloud or even to a modular cloud at the midpoint. And I was gonna, that's the first thing that came to my mind. How do you drive that capability without the connection back, right? There's not one big long wire or, or even, even if you say, well, we'll use satellites, that may also not be good enough. So is it kind of you're using it on the compute power that of the device itself? Absolutely. I think a great example, and there was an article written on it recently, the Ford GT has more lines of code in that that edge device than, than a Boeing aircraft does today. So when you think about the capability that's pushed in that platform out to the edge, it's disconnected. Right. Uh, you're driving that car, it's not connecting back to the cloud as you're driving it, but it is doing things out there while you're operating it that ultimately uh, will be replicated in tactical platforms. Andrew, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. Uh, I think, you know, I, I usually have this prop. I tell people, so, you know, I have a cell phone. That's going to be a data center. Today's data center in about, what, 20 years, 10 years. <laughs> Technology is accelerating, one, one or two great breakthroughs. So the idea that, you know, compute power is going to get less and less uh, as we go forward is, is not accurate. So we are going to rely on where the data is, uh, and that's going to be what I think the key, you know, to the data lake discussion is how do we actually federate all those data sources once we have compute power at the edge that's, you know, a data center today, what do we do? And that's what I think cloud is especially useful in is that service-oriented modular microservice design, uh, which I might add isn't new. It started in the 70s, uh, something called the Unix philosophy, philosophy you should look it up. Um, it, that enables us to both scale out, scale down, and federate uh, across the broad enterprise as we deal with these technology revolutions that will continue. That's one of the best parts about covering technology for the government and just broadly is things, more they change, the more they stay the same. I yep. mean, you talk about cloud, it was ASPs, you yep. know, alternative service providers and, and managed services and seat management. I go on all day. But let me turn to General Shanahan real quick on this one. Uh, when you, beyond, you know, when you guys look at, you know, uh, Project Maven and some of the other things you're working on, this tactical edge piece, getting the, 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 the compute power, but also the storage and all the pieces and parts, is that, something of a concern or, or the people that are going to be doing the pilot right now are all going to be connected well, but it's the next level that you start to worry about. Uh, that's a, it's actually, you said it very well, is 
uh, as we move out on the pilot project is to begin with these, these initial sites to really understand how you get it to work on those initial sites. And we'll go back three times to that first site to make sure that it's working as advertised and then begin to connect across the broader enterprise. For our, In this case, you will have the special operations, processing and exploitation sites, but also the broader services distributed common ground system, which is an, an entire enterprise reach back architecture. That's the intent is we will end up having these algorithms algorithms distribute across an entire architecture. We're not there right now because we're focused on getting it right on the tactical edge. And, and I will say this uh, every time, what's most important on this, I'm sure Margie would say the same thing, it's that user engagement early and often mm -hmm. and forever. Because if we just try to drop something called an algorithm, into our processing and exploitation workstation downrange, and the user has never seen it before, it will become that proverbial black box gathering dust in the corner. This is about from the very beginning when a user is talking with a software engineer to understand what each other's objectives are in developing this algorithm that is enormously beneficial to both sides. So we're in that process right now. Uh, it's all about process and exploitation workstations, but to, to what everybody has said, the intent would be to get it on platforms and sensors, truly on the tactical edge. You have to accept that there will be a disadvantaged environment, a famously bureaucratic term for you won't have reach back capability at some point. So how can you make this, this thing work? How can you make AI and machine learning to put it on a platform and sensor? And it only sends off what you've basically trained it to send off because you're not going to have bandwidth to send petabytes worth of full motion video. Uh, Margie, that brings us a great uh, segue to a part of the discussion I think you started to get into in the, in the last segment, which is as the Navy looks at, okay, ship to ship, ship to shore, it's, it's, it's not just, we, ca we can't just, you know, have a bigger pipe. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. So the, the designing and these processes, the AI, the machine learning, really is, is a big deal. And I think that's what General Shanahan was trying to get to. Talk a little bit about how you guys are looking at that design piece. Yeah, sure. Um, the general is exactly right. The, the design piece is um, very different for DOD than our traditional systems uh, requirements and procurement process, I'd say. So today we spend a lot of time, uh, we work with fleet users on what the requirements are. Uh, we tend to write them in documents that are 20 plus pages long. That's that's being very conservative, I'd say. Um, and then we turn that over to the acquisition community to go procure on timelines that are several years long in, in most cases. Uh, and the user doesn't see it again until they're being trained on the system, um, You know, again, several years later. Um, and when it comes to machine learning and AI, that really, the design process is really flipped on its head. Uh, as the general said, uh, not just early and often, but forever. The, the idea that you would continue to optimize the use of these analytics based off the user need is, is where we really need to go. And that starts with early engagement, continuous engagement, and a, a feedback loop that is just much more um, you know, flexible and frequent than, than we're used to. Um, so I think we're gonna have to take a look at our requirements processes. Um, you know, the traditional paper documentation that we use is going to be pretty uh, cumbersome and slow, um, and then our our timelines for how long it takes us to procure software is much different. Um, so part of that comes with having to actually um, you know put in place a good cloud foundation. One of the great things about cloud is it gives us a, a stable basis from which we can then jump off and innovate with with data and analytics. Um, but then putting in that user centered design process, figuring out how to have conversations with our our personnel around what they're really trying to do and what decisions they make, but then also creating experimentation environments where we can take them outside of the normal way of doing business and say, hey, if, if you could if you could think about this differently than how you were trained, if you could you know, do it like they do in the movies, for example, or, or if, if you could start from, from scratch, how would you actually design this? And then let's build those you know, software pieces around, around you as the user um, and around the mission outcomes that you really want to see, uh, instead of it just being a, a piece of gear that you turn over. Um, so I think we have a lot of work to do in DoD around how to actually make those processes much more flexible and rapid and, and scalable uh, for more of what we do. The process you're talking about, in many ways, is the same thing. I've, we've had conversations many times about Agile and DevOps, that, but it's the same thing. But so the AI piece is just using that Agile methodology for AI. I mean, yeah. there's really no difference. It sounds to me, <clears throat> right? Yeah, absolutely. Those are the core core building blocks. They're absolutely critical to going forward. We we also have to think a lot. Uh, 
in DOD around how we test this capability and how we certify it for safety. It, it is a different mission, you know, if somebody messes up on the, the search button, you know, you may, if you like this, you may also like that. <laughs> well, if you get that wrong, that's, that's probably okay. Um, if, you, if you identify someone wrong, if you, you know, get the wrong recommendation, um, that's a lot more consequential for DOD. And most of our uh, testing processes are designed around um, repeatable results. Well, with machine learning and AI, repeatable is, is, is not necessarily something you're going to see. So how do we really think about how we uh, test AI and machine learning capabilities in a way that is going to meet the DOD's mission and make sure that we've got the, um, the responsibility uh, that we need to, to have over these different types of algorithms? General Shanahan, jump in here, because are you guys finding that very similar challenge in terms of the repeatable process? If you want to test cybersecurity, you can look at the vulnerabilities, but but when you talk about AI and machine learning, that's a whole, sounds like a whole different No, it's, it's, it's exactly as Margie described it. In fact, uh, one of what we're finding out probably is most useful about what we've done with this pilot project is to develop the pipeline of what is this thing called machine learning, all the way from data acquisition through um, data labeling through preparing and developing an algorithm, but then this next point that Margie just talked about is test and validation and test and evaluation. What we're trying to do is just follow the industry standards, which are still um, still developing, uh, honestly, but we're, this is our most rigorous part of this, and there's not a lot of DOD standards that exist on algorithm test and validation and then the follow-on part of test and evaluation, and that we're taking as seriously as anything else. What concerns, uh, concerns us is there's a temptation for a lot of people in the field that know just enough to be dangerous about machine learning and say, I'll just pull an algorithm off open source, give me your data, and I'll develop an algorithm and field it. That will work for about 10 seconds, but we must have the rigor and the discipline behind this testing piece of it. And a lot of it is still manual. We're working with a number of, of sort of leading vendors on this to include um, uh, academia. Um, Carnegie Mellon, of course, is sort of leading edge in some of this to really get that process down. So by the time you feel something, you have a confidence that it's passed through these number of gates. But you'll continue to do, just as again, as Margie said, into the optimization piece of it to, to come back and review how it performed in that field environment. Lee, let me bring you in the conversation on this. The test and evaluation piece, the, the idea of, of developing AI, and it's more complex, more human. How does that kind of fit into what you're seeing uh, when, when, when your customers come to you and ask for help in these areas? What can you tell them? <laughs> so I, I think from a, a development standpoint, uh, as customers looking for this, and I think Project Maven is a great example, right? There are there are algorithms uh, around computer vision that have already been developed for commercial applications, and a lot of this can be leveraged by our DoD customers. They're generally not going to take it right off the shelf and use it that way, but it's going to be customized uh, through a dev process for the mission and ultimately for the end users. So th that's where we're participating, and we're, we're seeing uh, much more of a focus across DoD uh, on Agile and an understanding that uh, we really need to up-level the skills of not only the folks in DOD, but of the contractors supporting the DOD. I, I think that's the key piece here, is the skill set, and we could go down the path of a workforce discussion, but instead I'm gonna bring Andrew in. And so you hear about all these move to DevOps, move to Agile, this idea of user-centered design, get the users involved. The, the cloud piece of all this has to be the underlying to say, okay, do we have the, the, the the ability to support, and not just support, hey, yeah, okay, there's a cloud to go play in it, but there's there's different requirements and rules, if you will, around it. How do you ensure that that all, that, that everything fits under the umbrella well, that, that we call cloud? Well, well it does by, by default. By default. Because, I mean, agile, those sorts of things were used to develop a lot of the software that, that, that rides in there today, that manages it today. Um, I've been doing Agile personally for quite a number of years. I think the, the main difference of what they're talking about today is that the technology is moving faster. Uh, and it's one thing to ask a user, uh, what do you want to do? It's another thing to say, here's the art of the possible, right? And so part of what we're trying to get in place is bringing industry in to that part of the process, not just the, the people directly involved with the development, but the people that are out there kind of on the leading edge to say, okay, when you say requirement this and then this, that's not how you should do it. Maybe define it in outcomes and then let's work on requirements for, 
you know. So those are the sorts of tactics and techniques, and, the, and we're going to, I guess we can talk about the workforce piece later as well, but that's, you know, ensuring you have skilled government folks on the other side is, is important, uh, and that, is a ch that can be a challenge. Margie, uh, uh, Andrew brings up an interesting point, the, the outcome piece. And, and maybe I'll ask you and then maybe the general also jump in. What, do you, what is the outcome you're looking for, right? Is it, is it, okay, we need to connect two ships? Or is it the ships have to share data? Or like what, what's the, how do you define what the end result? Do you even know what the end result is sometimes? Yeah, so um, we have tons of end results, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, across, across the board, um, absolutely on the operational side around you know, decision making, um, our chief of naval operations likes to, likes to say that in the future, the advantage is really not gonna be to the people with the best sensors because everyone's gonna have data sensors, they're proliferating uh, quite a bit. It's gonna be to the, uh, the military or the, the team that has the best ability to make decisions and to do it in the fastest way and in the way that um, is you know, informed by the best information at the time. So um, figuring out what those outcomes are from our operational users is, is really key. Um, and then the readiness side as well to figure out, you know, are we making the best uh, decisions around how we allocate resources? Um, analytics can work on, on both sides and we, we have outcomes on both sides that we're looking at in the digital warfare office. Um, I mean, is it is it something that? Oh, let me turn to uh, General Shanahan. Is the outcome side something you can't predetermine your outcomes, and the outcomes are always going to? You say, well, we want to look at video better, but what's well, that mean, right? Well, and so this point is is uh, a central point is. I cannot define success. The intelligence analyst or the sensor operator will define it as a success. So if we put it in their hands, and as Andrew said, what's the art of the possible? In our early engagements right now, what we find is the algorithm's good. It's working as advertised. But it's what can you do with the algorithm that we don't even begin to understand yet. The analyst has said, well, could you give me a geofence around this particular coordinate? Could you give me alert when something comes in or out? The answer is yes, very much uh, we can do that, uh, but it's that constant engagement piece of it. And, and I, I expect a year from now, what the intelligence analysts and sensor operators be doing this algorithm will be so completely different than what we handed them on day one that we won't even see the difference. I almost have been starting to think of this as the difference between Pong and <laughs> StarCraft. Is, is That's a long journey that, that happened in a long time, but I think that's a year to two years in today's yes. algorithmic warfare environment. Instead of uh, decades. Yeah, decades. Right? That's a great point. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll, we'll jump more into the discussion. You're listening to the panel discussion, New Frontiers in Military Intelligence, Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning, and the Cloud, sponsored by Microsoft on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM.